Perhaps one of the most common traits of those who consider themselves to be a Christian truther is the simple fact that the Lord has given us a hunger for discerning the truth in the midst of the deceptions that surround us. It has already been revealed to many of us that much of what we once believed was tainted by the doctrines of men and, more importantly, the agenda of the enemy. As we continue deeper and deeper into a love for Christ and come farther and farther away from the lies of this world, it becomes clearer and clearer that any confusion and contradictions in Scripture cannot be possible, except where there is misunderstanding on our part. Over the last year, understanding the truth of the Word in the midst of the chaotic world of man-made theology has been at the forefront of the work that the Lord put on my heart. Videos like Faith is a Verb and Unlocking Romans 8 are just small pieces of what the Lord is showing me as I continuously seek the Spirit's guidance in clearing away any false theological assumptions that I once was content to trust in. Thankfully, through sincere prayer, reading, digging, fasting, studying, watching and begging the Spirit to clear away the fog so I can see more clearly, the Father has been taking me through a journey of understanding that I certainly wasn't expecting. There is much to consider and much to pray about as we all continuously seek the truth from the Spirit of God individually and corporately. And after all, He's been confirming with us through scripture, testimonies, and words of confirmation from brothers and sisters, it's hard to know where to start. However, I believe much of the trouble we as modern day so-called Christians face stems from a deep-rooted and catastrophically developed identity crisis. We'll address the commonly known Gentiles in a few minutes, but before we can fully understand this, we need to take a look at what the scriptures tell us about the houses of Israel and Judah. Did you catch that? The house of Judah and the house of Israel are clearly separated all throughout the scriptures. In fact, the identity crisis goes so deep, even our understanding of God's chosen people has become foggy, demonstrated by the modern church's frequent mislabeling of all Israel as the Jews. Don't worry, I've been guilty of this mindset as well, but we'll take a closer look. Now as we go through this video, we're going to have to properly define some commonly used terms to reflect a more historically and biblically accurate view of these terms. Specifically, Jews, Israel, the Ecclesia, Church, and Gentiles must all be examined to fully appreciate who's who in scripture, and there is perhaps no better place to start than the house of Israel and the house of Judah. You see, in 975 BC, during the reign of Rehoboam, the son of Solomon in the book of First Kings, ten of the tribes rejected Rehoboam and David's dynasty, while only two of the southern tribes remained loyal to the crown. The two loyal tribes were Judah and Benjamin. In the area of the northern ten tribes, Jeroboam was crowned as their new king and instituted a standard in which the northern tribes would no longer have contact with the southern kingdom, and even pilgrimages to Jerusalem by the northern tribes was deemed unnecessary. Since that time, the northern kingdom was known as the House of Israel, and the southern kingdom was known as the House of Judah. It should be noted that additional passages in Scripture refer to the northern kingdom as Israel, Ephraim, Samaria, Isaac, the house of Israel, and the ten tribes. The southern nation, which consisted of the tribes of Judah and Benjamin, was referred to as Judah, the house of Judah, or the Jews, and their capital being Jerusalem. Additionally, it should also be noted that when these names are used in Scripture, Separation and delineation between the two is made an intentional and important point. For example, we can see in the prophecy of Ezekiel chapter 37 that not only are these two houses, or 
two sticks, as scripture aptly names them, listed separately, but we're also told that a day will come in the future when the Most High will bring these two sticks back together under one united people, ruled with harmony forevermore. The word of the Lord came again unto me, saying, Moreover, thou son of man, take thee one stick and write upon it for Judah, and for the children of Israel his companions. Then take another stick and write upon it for Joseph, the stick of Ephraim, and for all the house of Israel his companions. And join them one to another into one stick, and they shall become one in thine hand. And when the children of thy people shall speak unto thee, saying, Wilt thou not shew us what thou meanest by these? Say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will take the stick of Joseph, which is in the hand of Ephraim, and the tribes of Israel his fellows, and I will put them with him, even with the stick of Judah, and make them one stick, and they shall be one in mine hand. And the sticks whereon thou writest shall be in thine hand before their eyes. And say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will take the children of Israel from among the heathen, whither they be gone, and will gather them on every side, and bring them into their own land. And I will make them one nation in the land upon the mountains of Israel, and one king shall be king to them all, and they shall no more meet two nations. Neither shall they be divided into two kingdoms any more at all. Another example of this clear separation in Scripture comes from 1 Samuel 11, verse 8, which is telling us of King Saul counting his troops at Bezek, when Scripture says, When he mustered them at Bezek, the people of Israel were 300,000, and the men of Judah 30,000. A distinct separation is mentioned here, the people of Israel and the men of Judah. And another quick example comes from Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 8, which says, And I saw, when for all causes whereby backsliding Israel committed adultery, I had put her away, and given her a bill of divorce. Yet her treacherous sister Judah feared not, but went and played the harlot also. So why is it important to clarify the distinction between those known as the Jews and those known as Israel? It's simple. Far too often, Christians of the Western world fail to differentiate between these two groups of people and, in doing so, fall into major theological errors which leave them with an inappropriate understanding of God's Word. Often, we'll hear pastors, teachers, and theologians make sweeping remarks concerning the children of Abraham mislabeling them all as Jews. But it is important to note that there was not a single Jew known as such upon the face of the earth earlier than 600 years after the death of Moses, about 1,500 years after Abraham was born. There were, of course, Hebrews and Israelites, but they were not Jews. In fact, a simple Bible word search will reveal that the word Jew wasn't first used in Scripture until 2 Kings 25.25. 25. In his 1821 book, Critical and Expository Bible Encyclopedia, Canon Fosse writes that, The idea that the house of Israel has been amalgamated and incorporated with the Jews is one of the most amazing errors in biblical history. We can't help but agree. In fact, this historic point is a commonly understood fact among those of the modern Jewish faith. So, now that it is clear that there is a scriptural distinction between these two kingdoms, it must also be made clear that after the dispersion of the northern kingdom of Israel in 721 BC, this kingdom made up of the ten tribes, never actually returned to the land either in biblical chronology or in known history. Further, it was prophesied in Ezekiel, Hosea, and Jeremiah that these tribes will not return to the land until the kickoff of the new millennium. Later, 2 Chronicles chapter 36 describes the captivity of the southern kingdom of Judah in approximately 606 BC, with their return to the land in the books of Ezra and Nehemiah occurring between the years of 536 and 432 BC. Additionally, it must be noted that Jeremiah prophesied that only they who were taken by Nebuchadnezzar to Babylon were to later return. Both Ezra and Nehemiah testified to the fact that historically, 
only those taken by Nebuchadnezzar to Babylon did actually return, which can be read in Ezra chapter 2 and Nehemiah chapter 7. Now with all this being stated, one simple question rises to the forefront of the mind. What happened to the northern house of Israel after they were scattered? This is a question that has been a topic of investigation, debate, and theory for centuries. However, we can be sure of a few things that the scriptures flat out tell us about these scattered tribes. First, it is important to understand that when the northern kingdom was scattered, God actually divorced them because of their unfaithfulness to the covenants he made with them through Abraham and Moses. Jeremiah chapter 3 verse 6 through 8 tells us of the words the Most High had for faithless Israel in about 627 BC. The Lord said to me in the days of King Josiah, Have you seen what she did, that faithless one Israel, how she went up on every high hill and under every green tree, and there played the whore? And I thought, after she has done all this, she will return to me. But she did not return, and her treacherous sister Judah saw it. She saw that for all the adulteries and all the faithless one Israel, I had sent her away with a decree of divorce. Yet her treacherous sister Judah did not fear, but she too went and played the whore. Because Ephraim, otherwise known as the house of Israel or the northern kingdom, continued to ignore the warnings of God's prophets and constantly provoked God with idolatry and lawlessness, it was finally time for the prophecies of Moses and Isaiah to come to pass. In the 8th century BC, hundreds of years after Moses' words were written down and just in the wake of the warnings of Isaiah, the Lord allowed the Assyrian army to gain power and turn their sights on Israel. With no protection from the Most High, the Assyrian army quickly dispatched nearly all of Israel and scattered the people across the earth. Deuteronomy 28.25 was fulfilled. But it is also important to note that this prophecy of the scattered tribes was actually the plan of God from the very beginning. Consider the moment when Jacob blessed Ephraim and Manasseh in Genesis chapter 48. In verse 17, Joseph notices that when blessing the two sons, his father Jacob did something odd. He placed his right hand on Ephraim, the younger of the two, and placed his left hand on Manasseh, the older. When Joseph resisted this move, thinking it was an error, his father Jacob stated the following, I know, my son, I know. He also shall become a people, and he also shall be great. But truly his younger brother shall be greater than he, and his descendants shall become a multitude of nations. So he blessed them that day, saying, By you Israel will pronounce blessings, saying, God make you as Ephraim and as Manasseh. So we see now that it was the plan from the very beginning, that Ephraim would one day become a multitude of nations, Interestingly, when we look at the Hebrew text in this verse, we can see that the Hebrew for multitude of nations is Meloha Goim, meaning the fullness of the nations. A very interesting literary note, as we'll see over the next few minutes. So why is this Hebrew statement so important to us? Well, I think it's time for us to discuss the word Gentile and see if everything starts to click into place. You see, all throughout Scripture, in both the Old Testament and the New, we find that when the Gentiles are mentioned in both the Greek and Hebrew texts, it is simply referring to the nations, those of the world who don't worship the one true God. For example, the word Gentile in the Greek is Strong's 1484 ethnos, which means a race, people, nation, the nations, heathen world, usually referring to unbelieving Gentiles. Additionally, 
we'll see that it is used to describe a multitude, the human race, race, nation, foreign nations not worshipping the true God, pagans, Gentiles. In the Hebrew, when we look at Gentiles, we find the word goy. Strong's word 1471 goy demonstrates that this simply means the nations as well. Simply put, Gentiles were anyone outside the faith who did not worship the one true Elohim of this world. Ephraim, or the northern kingdom of Israel, did not continue in the faith and obedience of the covenant, and so the Most High gave them a certificate of divorce and scattered them to join with and even become lost among the nations, or Gentiles. So now it should be clear that a Gentile is anyone who is not of the faith of the one true God. Remember also that the Hebrew for the multitude of nations promised to Ephraim through Jacob was Maloha Goyim, meaning the fullness of the nations or the fullness of the Gentiles. So, since in both the Old Testament and New, we can find piles of non-conflicting evidence that the Gentiles are simply those outside the family of God, this begs a very important and logical next question. Who is Israel? If the Most High considers everyone outside of his covenant family to be Gentiles, what does he consider of those who are within his covenant family? In Romans chapter 9, we are given a very strong clue as to the answer of this very question. In verses 6 through 8, we're told this, But it is not as though the word of God has failed, for not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel, and not all are children of Abraham because they are his offspring. But through Isaac shall your offspring be named. This means that it is not the children of the flesh who are the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted as offspring. Wait, how can it be true that not all who descended from Abraham and consider themselves blood relatives to the nation of Israel will be credited as actually belonging to Israel? Don't bloodlines matter to the Most High? Didn't you need to be born into a family of Israel to be considered one of God's chosen people in the Old Testament? No. In fact, the only time that bloodlines were critical was when Yahuwah was keeping his promises to specific individuals, such as his promise to bring about the Messiah through the lineage of King David, which, for the record, he did. In fact, we see in the Old Testament that Goyim, or Gentiles, were able to join the family of God's people with the same acceptance as a native-born Hebrew under the original covenant system. After being accepted into the covenant family, they were no longer considered Gentiles or of the nations, since they had joined in the ways of the Most High and were now considered a part of the Israeli family. Consider the words of the Most High in Exodus chapter 12, verse 48. And when a stranger shall sojourn with thee, and will keep the Passover to the Lord, let all his males be circumcised, and let him come near and keep it, and he shall be as one that is born in the land, for no uncircumcised person shall eat thereof. Not only did the law make room for the nations to join Israel, but God also revealed this same truth to his prophet in Isaiah 56, verses 6 through 8, when he said, Foreigners who bind themselves to the Lord to serve him, to love the name of the Lord, and to worship him, all who keep the Sabbath without desecrating it, and who hold fast to my covenant, these I will bring to my holy mountain and give them joy in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and sacrifices will be accepted on my altar, for my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations. The Sovereign Lord declares, He who gathers the exiles of Israel, I will gather still others to them besides those already gathered. And just for two more quick examples, we can see in Scripture that both Ruth and Rahab were not only assimilated into the people of Israel, but that they were even included in the genealogy of the very Messiah himself. So, now we can see that the Gentiles, otherwise known as Goyim, or the nations, 
were able to join Israel and be considered one of the natives. If only they would repent of their pagan practices and submit to the covenant promises of the Most High and follow Him. All this even under the original covenant. But for more even application to today's generations, we must ask who makes up the nation of Israel according to the New Testament? Paul tells us plainly that the physical children of the flesh, the blood lineage of Abraham, are not counted as the blessed offspring of Abraham by birth, but instead, the children of the promise are regarded as his offspring. Paul talks more about these children of the promise in Romans chapter 4, verse 13, which says, For the promise that Abraham would be heir of the world was not made to him and his descendants through the law, but through the righteousness that comes by faith. And in verse 16 we continue, Therefore the promise comes by faith, so that it may rest on grace and may be guaranteed to all Abraham's offspring, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who are of the faith of Abraham. He is father of us all. Additionally, Paul tells us more about the true children of Abraham in verses 14 and 16 of Romans 8, when he stated, for all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God, and the Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Next, let's move on to the book of Galatians, specifically chapter 3, verses 5-9, through 9, where we are told this, Does he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you do so by works of the law, or by hearing with faith? just as Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. Know then that it is those of the faith who are the sons of Abraham. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify these Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, In you shall all the nations be blessed. So then, those who are of faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. And later, in verses 28 through 29, we find this statement, There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is no male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus, and if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. I hope that the point is clearly being made here, that according to the New Testament, it is those of the faith in the Messiah who are the true seed of Abraham, and that our Heavenly Father makes no distinction between the Jews and the Gentiles once we are adopted by faith. We are the children of the promise, just as it was foretold by Jacob. Remember in the beginning of this study, we established that the Jews represent only the southern kingdom, and it is interesting that the northern kingdom was scattered and lost among the nations, or Gentiles. Keep that in mind as we read Ephesians chapter 2, verse 11 through 14. Therefore, remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh, called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands, remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenant of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. You see the connection? Verse 12 says that at one time we were alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, having no hope and without God in the world. But now, we are no longer alienated from Israel, aka the northern kingdom, since we have been brought near by the blood of Christ. It must also be noted here that there is no distinction in Scripture between the so-called church and any gathering of Israelites who are bonded by faith. 
According to scripture, the church, or ecclesia in Greek, is used to speak of God's people assembled in both the Old Testament and the New. In fact, when the word used for the assembly in the Old Testament Hebrew is cited, we get the word kahal, which means assembled or to gather as an assembly or congregation, identical to the Greek word ecclesia used in the Septuagint. Simply put, the ecclesia, the kahal, the assembly of God's children and the so-called church are all the exact same thing. It is no wonder that Paul warned us in 1 Timothy 1, 4 not to devote ourselves to endless genealogies. He knew that the children of Israel weren't established by bloodlines, but by faith. But this is just the beginning of our understanding, especially as it pertains to the significance of our identity in the Messiah. These scriptures unlock a powerful knowledge that has a dramatic effect on both the full purpose of the gospel, what's known as the mystery of the gospel, and the prophecies foretold all through scripture concerning the return of Israel. You see, earlier we read in Jeremiah, that God divorced Israel and sent her away to be scattered among the nations, or Gentiles. But we also know that it was foretold by the prophets that a day would come when the Most High would regather his people into the land that he gave our ancestors. Although there are many prophecies concerning this regathering from Jeremiah, Isaiah, and Ezekiel, for now, let's just look at an example from Isaiah 43, verses 5 through 7. Do not be afraid, for I am with you. I will gather you and your children from east and west and from north and south. I will bring my sons and daughters back to Israel from the distant corners of the earth. All who claim me as their God will come, for I have made them for my glory. It was I who created them. And another example from Ezekiel chapter 37 verses 21 through 22. And gave them this message from the sovereign Lord. I will gather the people of Israel from among the nations. I will bring them home to their own land and from the places where they have been scattered. I will unify them into one nation in the land. One king will rule them all. No longer will they be divided into two nations. But now we must ask ourselves, why is it such a big deal that the Lord promised to bring all of Israel, every last one of us, back into the promised land and back into a righteous relationship with him? Simply put, God's own law doesn't allow it. Remember how God gave Israel a certificate of divorce because of her whoredom? Well, as it turns out, according to the word of God, it is unlawful to remarry any formerly divorced spouse that has been defiled by another man. Consider Deuteronomy chapter 24 verses 1 through 4. When a man takes a wife and marries her, if then she finds no favor in his eyes because he has found some indecency in her, and he writes her a certificate of divorce and puts it in her hand and sends her out of his house, and she departs out of his house, and if she goes and becomes another man's wife, and the latter man hates her and writes her a certificate of divorce and puts it in her hand and sends her out of his house, or if the latter man dies, who took her to be his wife, then her former husband who sent her away may not take her again to be his wife after she has been defiled for that is an abomination before the lord and you shall not bring sin upon the land that the lord your god is giving you for an inheritance so if god divorced israel who played the harlot and whored after other gods how is it then that the most high would be able to become unified to her once again how could Israel ever become the bride of Christ?
This very question, the question of how the nations would be joined to righteousness, was to become what is commonly considered in the New Testament as the mystery of the gospel. Consider Ephesians chapter 3, verses 4 through 6, where Paul, someone highly acquainted with the law, wrote these words. When you read this, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to the sons of men in other generations as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. This mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body, and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Again, how can this be possible when we know that the nations defiled themselves with other gods before and after the Most High divorced them? Yahuwah cannot contradict himself or sin. Therefore, he knew that it would be necessary to demonstrate his redemptive plan for his people through the requirements of the law. So, why was the mystery of the gospel revealed to someone like Paul, who was so well acquainted with these laws? Simply put, it was because an understanding of the law was crucial in seeing this mystery truly unfold. Romans chapter 7 verses 1 through 3 Or do you not know, brothers? For I am speaking to those who know the law, that the law is binding on a person only as long as he lives. For a married woman is bound by law to her husband while he lives. But if her husband dies, she is released from the law of marriage. Accordingly, she will be called an adulteress if she lives with another man while her husband is alive. But if her husband dies, she is free from that law. And if she marries another man, she is not an adulteress. You see? In order for the adulterous nation of Israel to be redeemed from the law and be free to be remarried, her husband had to die. The mystery of the gospel was finally revealed. How did the Most High reconcile Israel to himself? The Son of God, Yeshua, our Messiah, died. Not only accomplishing the remission of all sin through his pure and perfect blood, not only establishing a new perfect priesthood, and a new holy temple, not only providing us permanent access to the throne of grace, but also fulfilling the requirements of the law which formerly bound Israel as a hopeless, adulterous widow. He set them free. He set us free to be made one flesh with and legally remarried to our Redeemer. So, what does this mean as it pertains to the prophecies of the return of Israel or the nations to the Promised Land? I believe that although there certainly is a spiritual component to this prophecy that we could say is already being fulfilled in us right now as we return to the faith of the Most High through our Messiah, many scholars, including historic and modern-day Messianic Jewish scholars, believe that this prophecy is yet to be fulfilled. In fact, I encourage you to research this matter and find that it is almost universally accepted among the current Jewish nation that the ten lost tribes of Israel are yet to be regathered into the land in a future fulfillment of scriptural prophecy. For more information on the future fulfillment of this prophecy and how we as the nations have been truly grafted into the house of Israel, check out the 119 Ministries video, Grafted In, and The Lost Sheep. I'll be sure to link these resources as well as many more mentioned in this video in the description box below. But just for now, after understanding the true nature of our identity as those grafted in from the scattered among the group of nations, or the Maloha Goyim, referenced by Jacob as the descendants of Ephraim all the way back in Genesis chapter 48, we can truly get a better appreciation of what Paul meant in Romans 11 verses 25 through 26, when he said, Lest ye be wise in your own sight, I do not want you to be unaware of this mystery. Brothers, a partial hardening has come upon Israel, until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And in this way, all Israel will be saved. 
The implications of this incredible truth from the scriptures is vast, and I'm certain that understanding this brings about a host of new questions in anticipation of future prophetic fulfillment. More importantly, what does this all mean for us as children of Abraham, children of the promise? In subsequent videos, we'll dive more deeply into answering these important questions. Be sure to subscribe and click the notification bell to be informed when the subsequent videos are released for viewing. But for now, we can at least see some flaws in one of the predominant man-made doctrines of the 19th century, specifically dispensational theology. For example, a dispensationalist might tell you that the words of our Messiah in the Gospels, the book of Hebrews, the book of James, and a few others, are not for the Gentiles, but for the Jews only. But we can see clearly now that this line of reasoning doesn't make any sense. Why would Yeshua and many of the apostles only be teaching to one of the twelve tribes of Israel? Think about that. The truth is, we are Israel, grafted in under the house of Ephraim. Therefore, even under a dispensational mindset, the teachings of these scriptures must have been, at the very least, for all Israel including those grafted in as children of the promise since the days of Abraham. It truly is time that we start taking the words of our Messiah, Yeshua HaMashiach, much more seriously. We'll end this video for now with the words of our Messiah during the Great Commission of Matthew chapter 28 verses 19 through 20. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. I pray that this lesson benefits you as you grow more deeply in love with our kinsman redeemer, our blessed savior, the glorious King of Israel, Yeshua HaMashiach, commonly referred to as Jesus Christ. I'm Justin with Christian Truthers. Blessings to you all and Shalom.